Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books are sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This Day in Sports History. Hey, and welcome to another edition of This Day in Sports History. It's May 18th, and on this day in different years, we said goodbye to two football greats whose lives ran parallel, but unfortunately never intersected on the football field. In 1963, running back Ernie Davis lost his battle with leukemia after a 10 month fight. Davis was the 1961 Heisman Trophy winner at Syracuse, becoming the first black player to ever receive that award. He was also a two-time All-American. Davis led the Orange men to a perfect 11-0 record, a win against Texas and the Cotton Bowl and the 1959 National Championship. In that Cotton Bowl win, Davis ran for a couple of touchdowns and threw for one. During his time at Syracuse, Davis erased a lot of the records that his predecessor, Jim Brown, had set. Davis wore the number 44, the same as Brown. He finished his collegiate career with 2,386 yards, 295 more than Brown. He was the top pick in the 1962 NFL Draft by the Washington Redskins, but was traded to the Cleveland Browns shortly after. The Browns also had Jim Brown. The two Syracuse legends were going to be in the same backfield in the pros. But at a camp prior to the annual college all-star game, doctors detected leukemia. He set out the 1962 season. By October of that year, though, doctors told him he was in remission and he was allowed to start training again. But that didn't last very long. His health started to deteriorate. And then on May 15th, Davis was admitted to a Cleveland hospital. He died on the 18th in 1963, never having played a down in the NFL. He was 23 years old. Now, it seems like Brown and Davis, despite their age difference, were intertwined. Both were stars at Syracuse. Both set records as running backs. Both wore number 44, and both were, for a time, Cleveland Browns. Add to that that Jim Brown died on this day in 2023, exactly 60 years after Davis and that seems almost eerie. Brown, who was one of the most outspoken and influential social justice warriors, had a great respect for the soft-spoken Davis, saying he just had a way of touching people emotionally. Anybody who ever knew Ernie Davis loved him. Brown played nine seasons in the NFL, rushing for more than 12,000 yards and 109 touchdowns in his career. He led the league in rushing eight out of the nine years that he played. He was the league MVP in four seasons, including his rookie year of 1957. He is, without a doubt, the greatest Cleveland Browns player of all time and was the player who set the standard for running backs in the league for decades. He was inducted into the National Football Hall of Fame in 1971 in his first year of eligibility. Interesting fact, Brown is the only person to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the Collegiate Football Hall of Fame, and the Lacrosse Hall of Fame. But of course, his legacy goes beyond football or athletics. He was involved in his community, pushing for civil rights and justice in the 1960s. In 1988, he created the Amer I Can Foundation for Social Change. The program was designed to help disadvantaged kids to develop life skills, reach and strive for academic success, and improve the quality of their lives. He had a voice even without athletic success, but the success that he had as an athlete elevated his platform and gave his voice more weight. Jim Brown was 87 when he died a year ago today. On this day in 1912, Pitcher Alan Travers gave up a major league record 26 hits and 24 runs in a game. He walked seven and struck out one in eight innings of work as the pitcher for the Detroit Tigers in a game against the Philadelphia Athletics. So this all sounds kind of weird, right? Why does a manager leave a pitcher in to get continuously shellacked? Well, 
There is a story, and it goes back to one of the stories I did on the May 15th edition of This Dish. If you'll remember, or if you want to go back and re-listen to it, I'll wait. But back on the 15th, Ty Cobb went into the stands after a fan who was insulting him. Van Johnson handed down a 10-game suspension after the game, to which Detroit Tiger players said they would sit out until Cobb was reinstated. Well, this is the game when the regulars started their sit-out. But owner Frank Navin still had to field a team or pay a $5,000 fine to the league. So Navin hired a group of semi-pros at $25 apiece to fill in and offered up an extra $25 for somebody to volunteer to pitch. Travers did, and he endured the 24-2 beatdown. This was the only game that Travers pitched in the majors, but his name is in the official registry. Van Johnson was not happy with Navin or the Tigers regulars. He threatened permanent suspension of players who refused to play. After Cobb encouraged the players to go back, they did. Travers decided that maybe baseball was not for him, and the priesthood sounded better. He enrolled in seminary a short time later. From that, I'll go to the opposite end of the spectrum. On this day in 2004, Arizona Diamondback Randy Johnson pitched a perfect game against Atlanta. This Braves team had some talent. Chipper Jones, Andrew Jones, Julio Franco, but Johnson was simply overpowering. He threw a total of 117 pitches, struck out 13, went to three balls on only one batter. Andrew Jones came the closest to breaking it up with a fifth-inning liner, but that was caught, and Johnson continued his perfect night for a 2-0 win. It was the 17th perfect game ever thrown, and at 40 years old, Johnson is also the oldest to ever throw one. In 1997, Tiger Woods won again. He was playing at the Byron Nelson Classic. This was his first tournament after winning the Masters, and he bagged the win by two shots over Lee Rinker. After the win, Tiger said it was great to be able to win with only his C game. That was a bit of a shock to the rest of the guys on tour, as Tiger continued to assault the record book. This was his fifth win in just his 16th PGA Tour start. That set a mark for quickest to five wins, topping Horton Smith's five wins in 27 tournaments. And let's end today's with a humorous golf story. Back in 2013, Nicholas Kolsarts was playing the Volvo World Match Play Championship in Bulgaria. On the 10th hole, Kolsarts' tee shot strayed a bit into a water hazard. Not like kersploosh, but more of a, a trickle into the shallows. Well, a fan, or I suppose in this case a non-fan of Colsarts, picked up his ball and then he deposited it in a nearby toilet, as in the bowl. Colsarts was given <clears throat> uh, relief outside of the loo, hit it within a few feet and he tapped in for a par despite a penalty stroke to have the hole. But he couldn't pull his game all the way out of the crapper, losing 2-1 and one to... Graham McDowell, who was the eventual winner of the event. And time now for today's non-sports did you know. The best Lego builders in the world can strive to be certified professionals, but it's not easy. As of 2021, there were only 21 certified professional Lego builders in the world. That's all for today. I'll be back tomorrow with more This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Suite production. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows... Or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do 
is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.